so hello everyone. Um, just to start off, uh, I am going to post the slides uh, to the website, um, and then if you need, if you want to talk to me afterwards, anything, uh, Twitter. I'm at Lineweber. Uh, one thing that I do have to say, I've learned the hard way, is if you do have your laptops and you go to my Twitter, then you go to my website from there. It does autoplay MIDI's, uh, so make sure you have the the sound off. There's been a couple of times where I could hear like my uh, my MIDI's playing th from the audience. I just put your sound off. <laughs> um, and yeah, so I'm going to talk uh, a little bit today about constraints, and uh, I can understand if that doesn't seem uh, particularly exciting yet. Uh, it took me uh, a long time to uh, realize the the power of constraints and why. I really uh, could benefit from them a lot as an application developer. Uh, you know, most talks at Postgres conferences are, you know, uh, you know, I just want to store my data. I want to learn tricks to get the data out faster. Uh, how to tune the database. Uh, you know, some indices, some uh, fancy common table expressions, or what have you. Uh, and this isn't that. This is a sort of, um, uh, you know, maybe not the most exciting uh, topic. Uh, and a lot of times with the uh, constraints, uh, it can seem as if it's just like your stern uh, parent telling you no or go clean your room or uh, in the case of Dimitri and Vic saying finish your ginormous dinner. But, um, uh, but the, the way uh, I was trying to make sense of this topic and explain like why maybe you want to really care about constraints, uh, I really started going back to think like how I got to where I am. And uh, you know, Rail, Ruby on Rails, like love it or hate it, it really... Uh, change the landscape of uh, application development. Uh, before, um, the applications that I saw and worked on uh, were really just uh, spaghetti code, um, you know, things emitting out some HTML, doing a database query in the middle of that, then putting out some more HTML, no real separation of concerns or anything. Or you had some uh, of the earlier frameworks that just had mountains of XML configuration all over the place. Uh, but then Rails really brought this concept of convention over configuration uh, and really taught people to embrace constraints, uh, separate out your code concerns, you know, put, <clears throat> do the model view controller sort of separation. Uh, they also had a bunch of uh, interest for a database conference, a bunch of just straight up, if you name your database, your tables ending with an S, we'll automatically know where to look. Um, and if, uh, you know, all the primary keys are just called ID. They're not called like person ID or anything. Uh, and so on and so forth. And sort of the, the name of the, the game was that if you do things in this way, all of these little like trivial concerns, trivial decisions that you had to make uh, were just made for you. And you could spend your time working on the decisions that made your app uh, your app. Uh, and all those little decisions, you know, they, they, you know, no particular one of them is that big. But in aggregate, they take up a lot of time. Uh, but at the same time as Rails did that for the like application side, they taught people to treat the database as just a big dumb hash in the sky. Um, and so they, you know, even at the beginning of Rails, uh, unique constraints weren't done in the database; they were done in the application, which isn't, um, you know, safe from race conditions. And all the, all of it was in the application. And they said, you know, just have your database, you know, be a dumb data store. Uh, and especially at the beginning, um, it was mainly just uh, MySQL. Uh, uh, just a little bit about uh, me before that. Uh, I worked at, I'm at Citus Data right now. Uh, before that, I worked at Heroku Postgres. And I think we really did a lot to promote Postgres uh, into the Rails community. And now uh, Rails has more and more uh, Postgres features. Uh, but at the, for a long time, because Rails and other ORMs want to have as big of audience as possible, they sort of have to target the least common denominator feature set between all the different databases, uh, which is good for them to attract more users, but it's bad for each individual user because you're not getting the full power of the database. Uh, lately, over the last few years, though, things are starting to get better. You're starting to see more uh, Postgres-specific supports in some of these ORMs, uh, which is nice. Uh, but while all this was going on, um, I was learning how to make uh, web applications. I started out mostly with uh, PHP and MySQL. I'm sorry to say, uh, but uh, you know it did the job. It, it you know got it done. Uh, I discovered a lot of important lessons during that time, uh, such as why 
update statements, you should have a where clause um, and not just accidentally rewrite your entire table. Uh, I also, the very important uh, lesson of starting a transaction uh, before you start messing around with some things. Um, you know, you know a, lot of, a lot of mistakes along the way, but uh, I, I'm sure uh, a lot of people <laughs> run into those. Um, and then also, uh, what was really difficult for me at the beginning was like learning like third normalized form and all that. Uh, it was hard to translate out the examples from, you know, oh, here's a, you know, a bookstore or here's, you know, this sort of common example to what I was actually making. And my, uh, my mom was moving houses uh, this Christmas and I found this whiteboard uh, in, in the basement and I remember, like this was you know, a long time ago, but it was still written on there, but I remember spending a lot of time just on this, these like three or four tables, like really like trying to get into my head the, the relationships between these uh, models, like how they're related, like what, what can do. And like this took me like so much time. Uh, and then today, uh, having done this you know, for so long, like I think when I'm bu building a new application, I tend to think actually about the tables first and then work backwards to what the code's gonna look like in the API. And that's probably um, a bit of a warped point of view from working with uh, Postgres services for so many years. But, uh, but it, what, what, I, what really struck me when I saw that marker board thing is I, I could put myself back in that situation of having to think like so hard about these things for so long and how it's more natural now. And I don't really know, there was no like point in time where that changed, but um, you know, it's just, uh, so anyone who is, you know, coming maybe new to application development or Postgres, like, uh, you know, it does get, it does get better. Um, and then one of the things that I picked up along the way and that I'm really uh, happy to be able to give this talk is something I realized that you want your database to be the last line of defense for bugs in your application. Uh, and this took, this took a, a long time to learn. Um, and when you are working on an application, your code is going to change so much more often than the database schema. Uh, you know, maybe when you're just starting out, they're changing at relatively the same rates as you're experimenting and figuring things out. But once the schema kind of gets set, uh, data sort of has you know, a weight, it sort of has inertia. It's hard to change the shape once it's already set there. Uh, you know, fortunately in Postgres, you can do most schema migration modifications inside a transaction, so that makes things a lot easier. But it still tends to happen uh, not very often. Um, and so if you look at this, uh, I was pulling some statistics from uh, the main app that we use at Citus Data to run uh, the control plane to spin up and uh, uh, monitor uh, formations of Citus clusters. Um, and when the app was about a year old, there have been 71 modifications, uh, migrations to the database. Uh, and this is anything from adding a new table uh, or adding some columns to a table, renaming some things. There's 71 of these after a year. And there were 1,200 releases to production in that same time. And so that, um, uh, you know, way more releases to production on the code side than on the database side. And right now the app's about two years old. And so I, uh, uh, yesterday I pulled the, num the new numbers. And so we added about 20 migrations, but 200 more releases in the last year. Uh, and so um, what would be interesting is to sort of see the relative rate of change of those things, but I wasn't able to uh, pull all that data in the time. But, um, but anyway, so you can see that, you know, it, it's natural to assume, but there's nice to have some numbers here that yes, the applications change so much more often. And if you assume that you have the same likelihood of writing a bug, um, and I, I do mean you, I've never written a bug in my life, that's for other people, but um, that's not true. Um, but so you're gonna be much more likely to have a bug in your application code than in you know, something wrong in your schema. You know, both are possible, but because the application is changing so much more frequently, it's so much more likely that you're gonna have some sort of logical corruption bug that you start writing uh, some bad data, you start uh, putting in some nulls where they're not supposed to be nulls, or you know, something is wrong. And the, the problem with these sorts of bugs, uh, you know, of course it's not the total cl class of all bugs, but you know, these sorts of bugs, 
is that you don't, they're sort of delayed. You don't, you don't notice them as they're happening. Um, and so the right will go in fine, but it's only later when you read the data and maybe, you know, maybe months later when you actually are reading the data for all that time uh, before you uh, notice that something's wrong. And also because it is the sort of delayed action, it's hard to find the cause of where, um, what's causing those problems. Uh, luckily, you know, if you're fortunate, maybe, maybe there's only one place where, you know, the, the, the particular table that has this problem, maybe all the writes come from one part of the code and you can go track that down. Uh, but more likely than not, you know, you're piecing together stuff from all over before you do the write and, you know, who knows what is causing the problem. Um, and this can go on for months and months writing bad, bad data and then you have to go and clean it up. Um, I remember one time I uh, was working on an application and I started noticing that there were some duplicate rows. Uh, you know, the primary key was there, so they weren't um, you know, duplicate with the primary key, but they were logically, you know, the same rows uh, with, you know, just like small differences. And there was, you know, not, it was like one third of the rows had these sorts of duplicates, but there wasn't enough information there to know really which is it should is row A the correct one or row B the correct one? Uh, and just kind of had to take a guess and be like, well, um, we're going to pick all of these ones uh, arbitrarily and wait for people to complain to see if something's wrong and like you know save that data off to the side and you know do some cleanup. But like uh, it's you know such a, a hard thing to do this sort of cleanup after the fact. Uh, and so the whole motivation and why um, yeah, I'm happy to share you know, my newfound love for constraints to everyone is it's so much easier if you just don't write the bad data in the first place. Uh, so we're gonna start out with some common uh, easy constraints that probably uh, many of you are familiar with and work up more to some advanced ones. Uh, not null is not uh, a, should, should, probably isn't a surprise, but it's, I think it's one of the most important ones. Uh, and the problem with it is because when you do create a new table, you do have to say not null for every single column you want not null. It should be the default. I don't think I'm ever gonna win that argument to uh, make, make the keyword be nullable and just by default uh, all schema creations be not null. I've tried to make that argument a little bit over a drink sometimes. I think that's a non-starter unfortunately, but it should be, it should be the case. Um, so really every single column more often than not should be not null. Uh, and the other thing very related is a unique index. Uh, I'd much rather everything that you know, should be unique add unique indexes on it. You do pay a little bit of a performance cost because every time a write goes in or a modification, it has to maintain that index. But I'd rather have everything possible be, have unique constraints and then if it does become a performance problem later, then you know, maybe look at relaxing some of those constraints. Um, and one of the nice things that Postgres has is you, know, you can have partial uniques. Uh, this comes in uh, very handy for two reasons. One, let's say you do have some sort of system where you know, user registers, uh, deletes their account, but you don't want to actually de destroy all that data, so you just mark a deleted at uh, timestamp, uh, and then they come and register again. And you know, for whatever reason, maybe you don't want to have that same thing. Uh, this will allow people to have unique emails, but over time, uh, then they can be duplicated over time. Uh, and the second benefit, I mean, the first benefit is just the ability to have that sort of um, uni a unique constraint on a smaller subset of the data. The second thing is often, um, even if you're not doing that, even if you're, you know, when someone re-registers, you reactivate the account, uh, this keeps the index itself a lot smaller and faster. Because if you have a lot of deleted, uh, you know, logically deleted rows, uh, not having to maintain the index over all of that uh, is also often uh, one of the first uh, performance increases that we've seen a lot of uh, you know, customers be able to be, be able to have. And really uh, those ones, and then all the uh, upcoming ones, is any assumptions you have about your data. You know, this property should always be positive, should always be present, you know, any sort of these um, uh, sort of things that you think your data should have uh, put that as a constraint, uh, you know, so you're not surprised later where like, oh, well, all of the numbers should have been between zero and one for this uh, percentage thing, but look, we have a, a 2.3, that's a, 
Well, that shouldn't have happened. But if you have the constraint there, then it won't happen. Uh, so going aside from the traditional sort of constraints, uh, data types themselves are a constraint uh, because they prevent wrong data from getting in. Now, a lot of people don't consider this being constraints, but uh, it does constrain you know, the shape of the data, the correct data type uh, from being written. Um, and so this, this lets you, you know, ensure that you know, numbers are actually going to be numbers. They're not going to be the string representation of the number if it came over like a HTTP git. Uh, you know, your Booleans are actually Booleans. It's not like some, uh, you know, tru you know tr Trulian. I don't know how you say the, th the three version, but you know, you get you get the you know the actual sort of types. Uh, and this is one of the things that Postgres particularly shines over other databases. I'm not going to call any of our other uh, friends, uh, database friends, uh, out by name, but a lot of them either do a lot of dangerous type coercion. Uh, for, you know, as a way to be helpful, um, or you know, maybe it's a big you know document store where you know all the types can be this or that. Uh, and what ends up happening is, on the application side, people end up putting these checks you know out of necessity in their application rather than having their database do it. Uh, but then, as we saw, that that's more prone uh, for bugs. Uh, one of my friends works at a company that uses um, a popular document database as the whole thing, and. He's constantly um, complaining about it to, to me and the other uh, Postgres people that we hang out with. So one of the you know, nice, you know, you have all the basic data types. You have the Booleans, numbers, and so on. Uh, but enums are a nice thing. Uh, it can ensure a limited set of values. Uh, there are some, some downsides, some caveats. Uh, you can't remove values from an enum. Uh, you can add them, uh, which is nice. But you can't make those changes inside a transaction, unfortunately. Um, and it, I, I've only recently started using uh, more and more enums. Uh, I don't really care about the, the space saving uh, nature of them, but that is, uh, you know, one nice attribute. Uh, but like, for example, uh, the name, the total list of names of Amazon Web Services regions. Uh, while they do add regions over time, uh, it's not that often. And this prevents me from, you know, typoing or misspelling, uh, you know, one of the regions from getting into the database and like festering there for a while. Uh, yeah, so mostly to prevent, I use it mostly to prevent typos. Um, ranges are a very nice uh, data type. There's been entire talks on ranges, so I'm not gonna, I'm only gonna give like a little bit. Uh, but if you haven't used uh, ranges yet, uh, you know, just fire up PSQL and play around with them. It's uh, pretty powerful. Uh, this little um, ASCII art uh, less than at sign means select if I is inside this range uh, one inclusive and ten exclusive. Uh, and so we can see here one is in there, five is in there, and then ten is not in there. Um, and so there's a number of uh, ranges, uh, you know, for regular ints, big ints, uh, numerics. Uh, I crossed out the timestamp range because I don't like the timestamp data type. Timestamp with time zone is very much better. And so I don't want to encourage people using timestamps. Uh, and then date ranges. Um, oh, so one of the, um, the things that uh, we use it for is um, to, and I'll get into this a little bit later, uh, is they allow exclusion constraints. Uh, and I'll have a whole section on the exclusion constraints in a little bit, but that's uh, another nice feature of uh, range types. Uh, and this isn't. I, I wanted to show this a little bit. It's not so much in uh, data types, but one small optimization. If you know that all of your, your text is going to be um, just like machine generated text, it's not going to have, uh, you know, like, uh, you know, fancy, um, you know, it's just, la you know, Latinate set. Um, so, for example, this is an Amazon instance ID. Like, it's only ever going to be the letter I, a dash, and then some hexadecimal characters. Um, if you change the collation to C, you get much faster like sorting, and uh, if you do have an index on it, then that uh, can improve the thing. But you do have to be careful if you do have any sort of like uh, French names. Uh, you don't want to do this because um, I know that can be uh, some problems. <laughs> um, so uh, there's you know a whole bunch of other data types. Uh, I'm not going to go into each and every type, 
but some of the ones that I use a lot, uh, UUID is very nice so that you know that uh, the format's gonna be 100%, you know, the version four UUID. Uh, MAC address, uh, INET and CIDR, uh, this can be helpful. Uh, I did one uh, small application where all of the uh, Meraki routers would send uh, presence beacons and I could, they had the MAC address of people's phones, so I stored that as the MAC address type. I'm like, hey, look, there's a type for that, that's nice. Uh, array and HR is very nice. Uh, and then ge geometric types, like if you are doing any sort of things with like boxes or shapes, uh, there's a whole set of types for that. Uh, and then also, you know, JSONB is very good. I really uh, enjoy having sort of a mix of a uh, you know, full schema and a you know, sort of schemaless part. Uh, one of the, the downsides, though, is you don't get all of this nice type checking inside the document. Um, there's some techniques where you can, um, that we'll get into uh, a little bit later, that you can do some of these enforcements, but it's fairly clunky. And if you have, you know, if you do have anything that's sort of like always there, uh, it's, you ought to promote that to a, a new column. Uh, and I say ought to, but um, I never get around to it myself, but I feel bad, I should do it, but. Um, so foreign keys, uh, this is a you know, you know, core relational model database thing. Uh, it's easy to do, you just add references and then the other table and the other column. Uh, some of the nice things that this gives you is that uh, it makes sure that you don't uh, start, start having mismatches where if something does, if this uh, you know, blog post if the user goes away or something went wrong and it's pointing to a user that's not there, you don't then get unexpected nulls in your application. You, have, you, know, you can force in the database that you know, for every one of these, it's pointing, it actually is pointing at another thing. Um, there's a couple options you can use to it. Uh, you know, to be honest, just the, the default uh, no action is uh, the, a very good default. Uh, you can change that, you can make that a little bit more strict by changing that up to restrict which uh, all that does is allow, uh, when the exception happens in your transaction, uh, it's sort of a, like, you know, it's a, you know, a very fine detail. Um, cascade, if you delete the other thing, it'll cascade that delete everywhere. Uh, and same thing, uh, set null, uh, it can null out the columns if that other thing gets deleted. Uh, the main problem that I've had with using foreign keys especially inside uh, you know, some of these uh, ORMs, is that it um, makes the testing harder. Especially, you know, most of my testing frameworks, they put the whole thing in a transaction uh, and then just abort the transaction at the end of the test. Uh, but if you start using transactions in your own code, uh, that starts getting difficult. Like maybe uh, up, you know, changing that to a save point can help. But often, um, you do need to have the, the testing framework, instead of doing a transaction, drop the tables or truncate the tables at the end. Uh, and this can be a problem when you're using these foreign keys because you have to then order the deletes in the appropriate way so that um, you're not getting uh, foreign key violations in your test cleanup. Uh, one of the things you can do to get around that a little bit is you can defer the constraints to the end of the transaction, and that can help. Um, in that case. Uh, so the next sort of thing is a check constraint, which this is nice because you can have full custom logic. Uh, and so you can really uh, enforce almost anything you want. Uh, this is starting, I think, personally getting into the realm of diminishing returns. Like if you have all the other, the data types, if you have uh, you know, not null and other columns, like that gives you so much bang for your buck. But um, you know the check constraints can um, can help you know get that last little bit out. Uh, a very common use for them is to just make sure that you know all the numbers are positive. Uh, I look through uh, in my couple uh, applications now, and almost all of them, all of the check constraints are mostly just this: having the um, the price be positive um, or the you know whatever the integer column. Um, you can also reference other columns. It doesn't have to be just with a static zero. So uh, this example comes actually from the Postgres documentation where if you have a sale price and the price, you always want to make sure that uh, the sale price is actually cheaper than uh, the original price. 
Uh, one of the things I do a lot with uh, check constraints after just if it's positive is um, seeing if the type is, if it's a sort of a, you know, a percentage multiplier that I want to have, I want to make sure that it is between zero and one. Uh, and this, uh, this gives you that uh, pretty easily. So I, said, I mentioned earlier, if you have JSON, you, know, you don't have sort of the constraints inside the JSON document. Because check constraints can do a lot, you can actually, um, you know, if you have a, a, a column called JSON column and you have a, a property that's supposed to be an integer, uh, you can pull that out, uh, cast it back to an integer, and then make sure that that is greater than zero. So you can start having constraints uh, you know, build up more and more complicated constraints as time goes on. Uh, and sort of to take this to the full, uh, the full example, uh, I couldn't come up with a very good example of a short uh, user-defined function that you would that makes sense. And so I chose one that doesn't really make sense. Uh, this is a just some math to, to know if a number is in the Fibonacci set or not. Uh, and so you make a function. Uh, the details of this don't really matter. Uh, but then you can create a table and then have that function be the check. And so here, you know, that example just did some math. You, can, you, have, you have full uh, PLPG SQL. You can do, you know, look at some other records. You can look at some, uh, you know, run some queries, do some computations, and return a Boolean, true or false, if the value matches that uh, check. Uh, and so in my only Fibonacci table, which is a very useful table, uh, I can insert five and eight, but if I try and uh, insert six, it won't let it in the table. Um, and if you have, you want to use this sort of check, uh, uh, you know, all over the place, uh, you can create what's called a domain. And this sort of makes an ad hoc data type uh, just for your database uh, that knows that all of these types uh, satisfy that condition. And then you can reuse that type in several tables. Uh, and so this is the sort of the same example. Um, unfortunately, I think the error message isn't quite as nice. Uh, this one it just says that one of the values violates it, but this one specifically says, if you do it the other way, it specifically says what the failing row contained. Um, but really, the only reason I chose uh, the Fibonacci thing is just to show off uh, this picture. <laughs> so. Uh, okay, so now for the... Uh, the last and uh, I think one of the most interesting features is uh, exclusion constraints. And this is a little, um, can be a little complicated, but, um, but it, it, when you have a problem that can be solved by exclusion constraints, uh, it really can't be done any other way. Um, and so going back to ranges, uh, the range data type has uh, a lot of operators. But one of the important ones for this is the ampersand ampersand operator. And what this does is overlaps. Uh, and so you can see here the range 1 to 10. Uh, we ask it, we ask Postgres, does it overlap with the range 15 to 20? And the answer is no. Uh, but 1 to 10 does overlap with 9 to 20. And so the answer is true. And so with this, um, the, the, the thing I'm using exclusion constraints for right now is our, our billing system. Uh, when someone makes a site information, we want to you know, charge them for that. And if there's any sort of change in price, like they, they get a discount, they scale up the formation, they scale it down, you know, add, add a couple nodes to the cluster, uh, then we want to change the price. But the last thing I want is for someone to, you know, if they have the database for a month and then they change the, they add a node uh, partway through the month, I don't want to double their bill uh, by charging for the old size and the new size. Like I really want to make sure that once I close out a billing record, uh, and open a new one that there's no overlap in those time periods. And so we have a, you know, a reference to our formation ID. We have this validity period, which is a timestamp with time zone. That's the, the correct data type. Timestamp with time zone range. And, um, and then we have the price. Um, and so the exclusion constraint uh, is, uses a, a gist index, which uh, we don't need to get into that right now. Uh, the formation ID with an equals. And so for any of the formation IDs, if the formation ID matches, so with you know, equality, uh, and the validity period with 
uh, overlaps. And so this will exclude anything that overlaps if the formation ID equals. Uh, and this is, uh, you know, this would take a lot of code in your application if you wanted to do this yourself and not have the database do it. And then there'd be, you know, room for a lot of problems. Uh, and this, what's really nice is once, as soon as you have this in here, if you try and insert something that overlaps, uh, you get kicked out right away. And the error message actually shows, uh, you know, the two parts, the ID and the range uh, that we set, set up in the exclusion constraint. And it shows you what it conflicted with. Um, and this, uh, this feature is, is very, very, very good. Okay, so sort of, uh, you know, recapping this, um, the three takeaways that I want you to have is that the database is the last line of defense against any sort of bugs you can have, in, I mean, most bugs you can have in your application uh, that would write bad data, rather than have it be written and then having to find it and clean it up later, having your database reject it as soon as possible uh, leads to uh, safer and more reliable applications. Uh, Postgres has a lot of really great constraints that you can apply. Um, I think applying just the very easy ones, uh, you know, such as not null can get you uh, a lot. Uh, especially though if you go to your application right now and say, oh yeah, these things should be not null, these things should be greater than zero. Uh, every time I've done that after the fact, I've always found mistakes that have gotten in. Uh, so the sooner that you can put these constraints in, uh, the better and the less cleanup you're gonna have to do. Uh, and then also, you know, data types are constraints too, um, which a lot of people don't consider them that way, but I think that's a nice way to think about data types. Uh, and so that's everything I have. I'm happy to answer questions uh, either now or um, in the hallway. Thank you. When we have a performance issue with our database, every aspect uh, say immediately uh, drops these constraints because uh, they drain your performance. What do you think of that? Uh, so you're you asking me if the if you're having these constraints, what the the performance on them is? Um, yeah. So I mean, it definitely, especially with the the check constraints and these things, you are going to take a hit on insert time. Um, most of the applications that I've done, especially like web applications. Uh, especially for anything that's user entered, uh, the rate of the inserts is so relatively low to the reads that I'm willing to pay the um, the hit. Uh, but if you're building an application that's ingesting, you know, like lots of machine generated um, thing, then you know having a lot of these constraints can uh, can be a hit. Um, but I think it's better to have them there and then notice that that's your performance problem. And then uh, if you notice that's a problem, then relax in constraints uh, later for performance. But uh, you know, the, the whole, you know, it's better to be correct first and then fast second is sort of, I think, a good. Uh, hello. Uh, I would like to know if you prefer to use enums over foreign key constraints over a table with the same values that you would use on your enum. And if you do that, why? Um, so I've, I've heard of that technique of having you know foreign key for the enums. Um, I haven't actually done it myself, um, only just because it's a, just that a little bit more cumbersome to have to uh, do the join or maybe make a view that that pulls it in. Um, the advantage of having it as a separate table would be it's easier to uh, modify it, uh, modify the types. You have a, a lot more control. Um, I do like the enums because. If I'm typing things out, you know, manually inside psql, uh, it makes a little more sense to me uh, just to type out the, the name. Um, but that is a, a good uh, alternative technique that um, I'm going to add that to this talk. So thank you. Okay. Okay. So thank you, okay. Will. Thank you.